Hi, I'm Sarah, a 40-year-old woman who thought she had everything ahead of her. I had a loving husband, Mark, a beautiful daughter, Lily, and a stable job that made our lives flow. Mark and I had been together since our college days. We were both nerdy economics majors. We met in classes that I don't remember now, but what I do remember is how Mark made me feel. He had such charm and wit that even the most boring lectures turned into sheer fun. We graduated, got married, changed a few jobs, and here we are 15 years later, nestled in our little house with a 10-year-old toddler. Life has been good, you know, ordinary, but good. One Thursday afternoon, I was sitting in the kitchen contemplating whether to salvage the burnt edges of the lasagna or just give up and order pizza when Mark walked into the room. He looked like he'd just lost his best friend. Slumped shoulders, downcast eyes, and a frown that only appeared when he was really tense. Hey, are you okay? I asked, setting the spatula aside and wiping my hands on a towel. Mark only shrugged, not meeting my gaze. Nothing, just a hard day at work. I knew Mark. On hard days at work, he'd rant about his boss or the latest political developments in the office. This was different. Come on, spit it out. I can see this isn't just work. What happened? He hesitated, then finally looked up at me. It's... it's my dad. I frowned. Your father? But you don't talk about him much. What about him? That's the thing, Sarah. He's sick. Very sick. He needs a lot of money for treatment. That news hit me like a brick. In all our years together, Mark rarely mentioned his biological father. He was raised by his stepfather, and I knew that. But his real father, it was as if he didn't exist until now. It hurt, but how? And what was the disease? I was full of questions, my mind churning with worry and confusion. Mark sank down in his chair, looking defeated. It's not good, Sarah. Some kind of rare disease. It's going to cost a tidy sum to treat. I took a deep breath, trying to make sense of the information. Okay, okay, we'll figure it out. We have some savings, right? We can start with that. Mark raised his head, a flicker of hope in his eyes that quickly faded. It won't be enough. It'll take everything we have and more. I paced around the kitchen, unable to stop worrying. It was a large sum of money. Sure, our savings were for emergencies, but this, this was huge. And yet, when I saw Mark so broken, so desperate to help his father, a man I knew almost nothing about, it touched something in me. Look, we'll get through this. We always make it through, I said, trying to sound more confident than I felt. We can tighten the belt, cut back on some things. Your father needs that, right? Mark nodded, looking at me with the kind of eyes that always seemed to see right through me. Thank you, Sarah. I knew I could count on you. But this is a lot. I just... I don't know how to deal with all this. We talked late into the night, going over our finances, trying to come up with a plan. It was hard, harder than anything we'd faced before, but we were a team, Mark and I. We would get through this together, one way or another. The next few days were a blur of phone calls, meetings with doctors, and financial planning. Mark was on edge, snapping at little things, which wasn't like him. But I chalked it up to the stress, the weight of his father's illness hanging over us like a dark cloud. The financial strain was one thing, but it was the emotional toll that really started to wear us down. Mark became more withdrawn, and I found myself walking on eggshells around him, trying to keep the peace while juggling our budget to make ends meet. One evening, after Lily had gone to bed, Mark and I sat down at the kitchen table, a pile of bills and our laptop open to our bank account in front of us. The air was heavy, charged with an unspoken anxiety as we tried to figure out our next move. Mark broke the silence, his voice low and strained. We need more money, Sarah. It's just not enough. Dad's treatment is more expensive than we thought. I rubbed my temples, feeling the onset of a headache. I know, Mark, but we're stretched thin as it is. We've cut back on everything we can. There's just no more to give. That's when Mark dropped the bombshell. What about your apartment? The one you inherited from your mom? If we sell that... I felt my heart stop for a second. Sell the apartment? Mark knew that's for Lily. We promised we'd keep it for her future. Mark slammed his fist on the table, making me jump. 
Sarah, this is my dad we're talking about. Your mother's gone and Lily's got us. My dad has nobody else. I recoiled, shocked by his outburst. Lower your voice, Mark. Lily might hear, I hissed, my own temper flaring. And don't you dare bring my mom into this. That apartment is all I have left of her. Plus, it's our safety net, our daughter's safety net. You can't ask me to give that up. Mark stood up, pacing back and forth like a caged animal. So what? My dad's life isn't worth as much as an apartment. Is that it? That's not fair, and you know it, I shot back, standing my ground. It's not about worth. It's about keeping our promise to our daughter. It's about not sacrificing our future for... For what, Mark? For my dad? Just say it. You think he's not worth the trouble. The accusation in his voice cut me deep. Mark, stop it. This isn't about worth. It's about being rational. There has to be another way. We can't just upend our lives, Lily's future, on a... Mark shook his head, his expression one of utter defeat. You just don't get it, do you? It's like you don't even care. I do care, Mark. I care about all of us. But selling the apartment isn't the solution. It's not just about the money. It's about what we're teaching our daughter, about family, about making hard choices. For a moment, there was silence, both of us breathing heavily, the weight of our argument hanging in the air. Finally, Mark spoke, his voice cold and distant. I need some air. And with that, he grabbed his coat and walked out, leaving me standing alone in the kitchen, surrounded by unpaid bills and a marriage that felt like it was starting to crumble. The rest of the night was a blur. I couldn't sleep, tossing and turning, replaying our argument over and over in my head. Was I being unreasonable? Was I putting material things over family? But then wasn't Lily our family too? Wasn't her future just as important? After what felt like ages, Mark and I finally found a way to patch things up. It was one of those late night talks where you lay everything out on the table, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We were both drained, emotionally spent, but determined to get past this hurdle. I wanted to believe we could find our way back to each other, to the love that had once been so strong. In a bid to bridge the gap between us, I suggested, why don't we go see your dad together? It might be good for you, for us. Mark's reaction was odd, to say the least. He fidgeted, avoided my gaze, and mumbled, it's not possible right now. How come? I pressed, my brow furrowing in confusion. His vague response didn't sit right with me, but before I could dig deeper, life decided to throw another curveball my way. Just a few days later, as I was making my way back from work, lost in thought about everything that had been happening, a car came out of nowhere. The impact was sudden, shocking, leaving me dazed and in pain on the cold pavement. The next thing I knew, I was in the hospital, diagnosed with a concussion. The doctor said I needed long-term treatment, which meant more time off work, more bills, and more stress. But worse than the physical pain was the realization that Mark didn't come to visit, not once. It was Lily who kept me company, her small, worried face a constant reminder of the strength and innocence we're supposed to protect. Mama, why hasn't Daddy come to see you? She asked one evening her voice small in the too quiet room. I didn't know how to explain to her that I had no answer. Daddy's busy, sweetheart, but it's okay. We have each other, and Grandma's been a big help, hasn't she? She nodded, though I could tell she was far from convinced. I just wish Daddy was here too. Me too, baby. Me too, I whispered, hugging her close, trying not to show my own disappointment and hurt. Lying in that hospital bit night after night gave me too much time to think about Mark, about us, about the future. Something had to change. We couldn't go on like this, with secrets and silence driving a wedge between us. It wasn't just about me anymore. It was about Lily and the kind of life I wanted for her. Walking back into our home, the emptiness hit me like a cold wave. The living room, once filled with laughter and warmth, was now bare, stripped of our TV, the stereo, and even the little jewelry box that had been my grandmother's. My heart raced, a mix of fear and disbelief coursing through me. Lily clung to my side, her confusion mirroring my own. Mom, what happened? Where's all our stuff? 
Her voice was small, scared. I was struggling to make sense of it all, to find the words to explain something I couldn't understand myself. I don't know, Lily. This doesn't make any sense. Panic set in. My first thought was to call the police, report a burglar. But before I could act on that impulse, I needed to hear it from Mark, to understand if he knew what had happened. With shaking hands, I dialed his number, half hoping he wouldn't pick up, half desperate to hear his voice. Mark, our house, everything's gone. Did you know about this? What's going on? There was a pause, a silence that seemed to stretch on forever before he finally spoke, his voice laced with a desperation I'd never heard before. Sarah, please don't call the police. I can explain. I'll be home soon. Just wait for me. The line went dead, leaving me with more questions than answers. Lily looked up at me, her eyes searching for reassurance. I didn't feel it. Is dad coming home? Yeah, baby, he is. He said he'd explain everything. But could I believe him? The man who hadn't been there when I needed him the most, who now claimed responsibility for the disappearance of our belongings. When Mark finally walked through the door that evening, he looked defeated, a shell of the man I once knew. I braced myself, ready to confront him, to demand the truth. He didn't wait for me to start. I... I took them, Sarah. I sold everything. It was the only way I could think of to pay for my dad's treatment. His words hit me like a physical blow. You... What? How could you do this without talking to me first? Do you have any idea how scared we were? I know, I know. And I'm so sorry. It was wrong, but I didn't know what else to do. His condition got worse and I just panicked. And you couldn't even be there for me in the hospital. Was that because of your dad too? He looked away, the guilt evident in his posture. Yes, I was with him. He needed me, and I thought I could handle everything. I was wrong. The room was heavy with his confession, with the weight of his choices. Part of me wanted to scream, to lash out at him for the betrayal, for the lies. But another part, a quieter, more calculating side, held back. I nodded, pretending to accept his apology, his explanation. Okay, Mark, we'll figure this out. But as he relaxed, relieved at my apparent understanding, I knew this was far from over. Accepting his apology out loud was one thing. Truly forgiving him, moving past this, was another. And deep down, I knew things couldn't go back to the way they were. Not now. I didn't call the police. Not because I believed his story, but because I needed time. Time to think, to plan my next move. Mark thought he had smoothed things over, but this was a betrayal that couldn't be brushed under the rug with a simple apology. As I put Lily to bed that night, reassuring her that everything would be okay, I made a silent promise to myself. I would get to the bottom of this, uncover the full truth of Mark's actions, and protect our daughter from the fallout. After Mark's confession and his bizarre behavior, things just didn't add up for me. I decided it was time to get some outside help. So I reached out to a friend of mine, Carla, who had made a career out of uncovering truths people worked hard to bury. She was a private investigator, and if anyone could get to the bottom of this mess, it was her. Carla, it's me, I said, my voice a mix of desperation and determination. I need your help. Mark's been acting strange, and I think there's more going on than he's letting on. Carla, ever the professional, didn't miss a beat. Tell me everything, she said and I did. I spilled the beans about the missing valuables, Mark's vague explanation about his dad's health, and how none of it sat right with me. All right, I'm on it, she assured me after I finished. But you've got to be patient. These things take time. Patient. That word echoed in my mind as I hung up. Patient had never been my strong suit, but I knew Carla was right. I needed to wait for her to do her thing. However, Waiting wasn't in the cards for me. A nagging thought kept tugging at the back of my mind, leading me to make a call I never thought I'd have to. I dialed Mark's mom and stepdad, trying to sound casual as I asked about the health of Mark's biological father. The silence on the other end of the line was telling. When they finally spoke, their confusion was palpable. Sarah, dear, what are you talking about? Mark's dad passed away years ago. The floor might as well have opened up beneath me. 
Years ago? I echoed, feeling a mix of anger and betrayal swirling inside me. Yes, I'm so sorry. Did Mark not tell you? The concern in their voices was genuine, but it only fueled my growing sense of dread. Um, no, he didn't. Thanks, I mumbled, ending the call as quickly as I could. I sat there, phone in hand, the pieces clicking into place. All the lies, the deceit, it all made sense now. Mark had been playing me, using his dead father as a ploy to siphon off our savings for who knows what. The revelation left me reeling, but I knew I couldn't confront Mark without solid proof of where the money was actually going. And for that, I needed Carla's findings. In the meantime, I played the part of the unaware wife, a role that chafed with every passing moment. Mark continued on as if nothing was amiss, unaware of the storm brewing just beneath the surface. Each day that passed was a test of my patience, a slow march towards the inevitable confrontation. But I was determined to wait, to gather all the ammunition I needed to face Mark with the truth. After what felt like an eternity, Carla finally called me with an update. My heart pounded in anticipation as I picked up the phone. Sarah, we need to talk. Can you meet me at the cafe on 5th? She asked, her tone serious. Sure, I'll be there in 20, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady despite the storm of emotions raging inside me. Sitting across from Carla in the dimly lit cafe, the air felt heavy with unspoken truths. She slid a folder across the table towards me. Sarah, I found quite a bit. Are you sure you're ready for this? Taking a deep breath, I nodded. I need to know, Carla, no matter how bad it is. She proceeded to lay it all out. The surveillance photos of Mark with a woman I didn't recognize, receipts for fancy dinners, hotel stays, and most damning of all, an agreement for an apartment I knew nothing about. The evidence is irrefutable, Sarah. Mark has been leading a double life. Who is she? I asked, my voice barely a whisper, as I stared at the photos of them together, laughing, touching, sharing moments that were supposed to be reserved for us. Carla, I don't have all the details on her, but it's clear they've been seeing each other for a while. And Sarah, there's more. I think they have a child together. A child. The word echoed in my head. A cruel twist in the already painful revelation. A child, I repeated numb. I'm so sorry, Sarah. I can only imagine how you must feel, Carla said, her voice full of sympathy, anger, betrayal, and sadness. It was all too much. How could he do this to us, to me, to Lily? Carla reached across the table, offering a comforting hand. I wish I had the answers, Sarah, but know this. You're not alone. You've got people who love you, who stand by you through this. The drive home was a blur. I was a tempest of emotions, each one vying for dominance. Betrayal stung the most. The realization that the man I had loved and trusted had deceived me in the most unimaginable way. I waited for him at home, the folder of evidence on the kitchen table, a silent witness to the unraveling of our life together. The moment he walked in, I could see the apprehension in his eyes, a clear sign he knew the reckoning had come. Sit down, Mark. We need to talk, I said, my voice steady, quelling the turmoil inside. He complied, taking a seat opposite me, avoiding my gaze. Sarah, I know. I cut him off, my hand raised to stop him. You've lied enough. It's my turn to talk. I know about her, Mark, and the child. I know everything. Mark's face paled, the reality of his situation finally sinking in. Sarah, I'm so sorry. I never wanted to hurt you. Sorry doesn't change anything, Mark. You've destroyed our family. And all you can say is you're sorry? My voice rose in anger, but I quickly composed myself. This wasn't about unleashing my rage. It was about getting answers and deciding where to go from here. He tried to explain, to weave a story of confusion and mistakes, but I wasn't having any of it. Stop, Mark. Just stop the lies. End now. I want to know why. Why did you do it? Why throw away everything we had? Mark's usual confidence was gone, replaced by a man cornered by his own deceit. I don't know, Sarah. I got lost, caught up in something I didn't understand. I thought I could keep it separate, that it wouldn't affect us. I was wrong. Caught up? You made choices, Mark. Choices that betrayed your family. Did you even think about Lily in all of this? 
what this would do to her. He had no answer, just a shake of his head, a man defeated by his own actions. The conversation went on, circles of apologies and excuses, but it was clear too much had been broken. Trust, once shattered, couldn't simply be glued back together. I want a divorce, Mark. There's no coming back from this, I said, the words heavy but necessary. Mark didn't fight it, perhaps realizing the depth of his betrayal left no other path. I'll do whatever you think is best. I just, I hope you can find it in you to forgive me someday, for Lily's sake. Forgiveness? That's a long road, Mark. Right now, I need to think about Lily and me, about how we move forward from this mess. As he left the house that night, it felt like the closing of a long, tumultuous chapter. The confrontation had been painful, yes, but it was also the first step towards a new beginning, a chance to rebuild and find happiness again, free from the shadows of deception. After the dust settled on the courtroom battles, I found myself sitting across from Lily at our kitchen table, the weight of the last few months seemingly lifted off our shoulders. The judge had ruled in our favor, acknowledging the depth of betrayal and deceit Mark had entangled us in. He was ordered to pay a hefty sum for his infidelity, the lies about his father's health, and for all the things he'd taken and sold from our home. Mom, does this mean it's all over now? Lily asked, her spoon paused midair over her cereal bowl. I nodded, stirring in my coffee, the steam curling up like the complicated emotions I felt. Yes, baby, it's over. We can start fresh now. Lily smiled, a genuine, relieved smile that reached her eyes. Good. I didn't like seeing you so sad. Later that day, I took a moment for myself, sitting in the quiet of our living room. The legal victory was bittersweet. Yes, Mark was being held accountable financially, at least for the chaos he caused. But no amount of money could erase the betrayal or the impact it had on Lily and me. I heard from mutual friends that Mark and his new family were struggling, the financial strain causing constant arguments. It was a situation he brought on himself, choosing a path of deceit that led him away from us and into turmoil. His parents, once a part of our extended family, had cut ties with him, disgusted by his actions and the lies about his deceased father. It was a harsh reality, but one Mark had sculpted with his choices. As for me, I focused on rebuilding our lives, ensuring Lily felt secure and loved, something money couldn't buy. One evening, as Lily and I were arranging some new books on our shelves, a symbol of our new beginnings, she turned to me and said, Mom, I'm glad we're together, just us. It feels, feels right. Her words warmed my heart, echoing my thoughts. Me too, Lily. We've got each other and that's all that matters. Our journey hadn't been easy, and I knew challenges lay ahead. But as I looked at our little home filled with love and laughter, I felt a sense of peace. We were moving forward, not just surviving but thriving on our terms.